Hello and welcome to Comnections, brought to you by the MA in Communication Program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features Natasha Mandarata discussing the power of being social on social. Please note today's program will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Comnections playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our moderator, Dr. Patricia Hernandez, Assistant Program Director for the Master of Arts in Communication Program. Thank you. And again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining and thank you so much, Natasha, for uh, being on this uh, panel or not panel to, to be the host of this uh, webinar. We're excited to have you. Uh, so Natasha is also an alum of the program. Uh, and so I'm going to give her the honor of introducing herself and talk more about her experience. Uh, and so again, thank you for being here and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you so much, Patricia. I'm just going to go ahead and, and share my screen here. Um, but so nice to meet everybody. Um, proud alum of JHU here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the power of being social on social. Um, just a little bit about me. I um, work at IPG Health. IPG Health is um, one of the or is the largest health marketing network in the world. And I work to um, oversee their digital strategy, their social and their website. Um, and also help the many different agencies with their social and website strategies as well. And previously, I worked at New York University at their School of Education, where I oversaw their social strategy. And the reason I'm going through that is not just to go through my past history, but in this presentation, we'll be going through um, some examples of the work that I've done in both of those and how those social principles, um, you know, the power of being social have been weaved into all of them to lead to success. So first, I say this all the time, but social media by definition is social. So when we're talking about, you know, how success, how to be successful on social media, a lot of us often think, and I know when I started in the job as well, like what is the content that we're going to post to talk about our benefits, our products and more. Um, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't relate to the uh, why those platforms were built to be social. So let's say, you know, when I worked at NYU before, people thought that if we post about our program, people are going to come flooding because, you know, it's just that amazing. But it didn't take into account why these platforms were designed to create connections, to create community. Um, so before we go around posting content, you know, shouting it to the universe, universe like we're using a bullhorn, like pay attention to me. We need to talk about like the nature of social media, how it's designed how people use it and behave, how they use it to, and how that's used to shape social strategy, foster brand loyalty, and encourage action with a brand. So I'll be going through um, multiple like social principles that relate to, uh, to social media, but also being social and creating connections. And I'll show a ton of examples and takeaways from there. Um, so the first principle here is prioritize relevancy. So we're often bombarded with content on a daily basis and our minds are weren't meant to process this much stimuli coming in. So we only pay attention to something that captures our attention and is meaningful to us. Um, so everything else we just scroll past. And also throughout this presentation, I encourage you to think about your own social behavior as well. Um, like as I'm talking, like what do you do when you're on social media, Instagram, TikTok, whatever. Um, so, and also throughout this presentation, sorry to backtrack a little bit, the examples I'm sharing are not for one particular platform because this isn't a presentation where I'm gonna say like, be real is the next big thing. Um, these are principles that apply across all different platforms. So you'll see examples from across all different platforms as well, because as we're seeing with TikTok in real time, platforms come and go, but you know, our psychology, the reason we do what we do, that doesn't change. So going back to relevancy, um, imagine you're at a party, you're sitting on a couch, the person to the left of you is having a conversation about something you're really interested in. For me, that's coffee. The person to my right or the person on the other side is talking about football. I'm not necessarily interested in football. It's not relevant to me. I'm tuning into the conversation about coffee. And even though those people are like the same distance apart, I'm only hearing the person on the left. So we only tune into things that are relevant to us. 
So for something to be relevant, we need to understand why a person acts the way they do, um, what's important to them and what's not, and to design content accordingly, both the topic and how it's actually designed. Um, the algorithm sees that a certain brand is relevant to them, and they keep showing up, showing that content more and more to a person's feed. If you, you know, like, I don't know, Ford's cars, like photos, all of a sudden you see more things about Ford cars. That's because, you know, Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn has deemed Ford cars like relevant to you. Also bonus fact, and we're not going to get into this, but um, when we see something, sorry, when we see something that captures our attention and that's meaningful to us, we actually get a hit of dopamine. So that's why we're often like keep scrolling because we want that hit. So going into some examples, um, this was from my time at New York University. I had worked at the School of Education and we had often created um, these Instagram takeovers where we had students that we trusted um, take over our account and ask, uh, answer prospective students or current students questions because it created that connection. And we often saw those were like our best performing content for that reason, it created connections. Um, so someone had asked, what are the dorm rooms like? And so they shot this video of what a dorm room looked like and a lot of people reacted to it. So we were like, okay, let's download that and turn it into a TikTok. The video that you see here reached about 52,000 people. And our average at that time was maybe about like 700 people. So it clearly outperformed everything else because it was relevant to the people who wanted to see it. When we were often posting about, you know, joining NYU, we were talking about, you know, meet your advisors, the things that we thought that we wanted, that we thought they wanted to see. But this experiment showed us that wasn't necessarily the case. So the behind the scenes view of what it's like to be a freshman, the life of being a freshman, that is the thing that um, performed best. And also um, people shared it with each other. Social media, the basis is on shares because there were people who were seeing it that were joining NYU as freshmen. They were interested as high schoolers. And so they showed it to other people who were also interested in um, you know, NYU or just college life as a whole. So Matthew Lieberman, he's a UCLA professor. He said, people are regularly attuned to how the things they're seeing will be useful and interesting, not just to themselves, but also to other people. We always seem to be on the lookout for who else will find this helpful, amusing, or interesting. And our brain data are showing evidence of that. So literally our brains are on the lookout for what we can share with other people. So creating relevant content that people want to share with other people is such a huge key to being successful on social, no matter what platform you're on. Here's another example. This is um, from my job now at IPG Health. Um, we had uh, someone write a point of view, an insight piece on text to image um, AI. So if you don't know what that is, you input a description about an image and it pops out that image. So super simple. And we were posting a lot of like of design graphics, all of that. So we were like, you know what? Let's just try and like do the text to image ourselves and post that image. So the engagement here is you saw like 152 likes. Our average was about 40 at that time. So like three times the engagement. And we were like, oh, our audience is interested in tech. So we took that insight and we started to create more content. But creating content that was relevant to that audience led them to save it, which the algorithm prefers. And it led them to stop scrolling as well. Because as I mentioned before, we keep scrolling to find what's relevant to us. So the thing needs to pop out at us and be like, hey, this is going to be of interest to you for people to stop. So some takeaways from those previous slides. To understand your audience's behavior, what will get them to stop scrolling, uh, what will get them to engage, and more importantly, what will make them form that relationship with your brand, think of them as a best friend. And this isn't just demographics. And I think this is one of the things that, you know, this program at J2 is awesome at is that it prioritizes research because we can say that I'm a 30-year-old Indian woman and that's my demographics and people should target me based on that. But I am so much more than that. I love to work out. I love to teach. I love to do so many other things. So people who understand me know all of these things. So treat your audience like that best friend as well. Learn what gets them up in the morning, what they enjoy doing in their free time, what they like learning about, whether it's like what the dorms look like for a freshman or text to image and AI, 
um, how they talk and how they act and what drives them and incorporate, use that to shape your content and, you know, step away from, you know, what platform works best and all of that, because that this is the thing that really matters. Um, and you can see it in how these platforms are designed as well. Instagram has an explore page. TikTok literally calls it for you because it's relevant for you. So the next thing is to take a step back. So often when we're, when we're creating content, and I've done this so many times, we're creating a video. It's taken two weeks to get to, uh, to put together a video. And we love this video. We can't wait to put it out into the universe, but it just doesn't do well. So one thing I've started to do is to literally take a step back. If I was this person, if I was scrolling through my feed and I saw this you know, piece of content, um, would I stop scrolling? Would I engage? Would I save it? Would I share it? I envision myself, um, I envision it showing up in my feed. And if I can't pay attention to it, if I'm not engaged, you shouldn't expect other people to either. So make it relevant, pop it, like make sure that it's focused on people in people's feeds, and then it's often successful. So the next point here is being authentic. People don't want polished content. People want real experiences with real people and real brands. And one of these points, and I'm going to mention this again, but it's one of our like psychological needs to feel a part of a community, to feel belonging. So by, you know, putting out overly polished content, you don't serve that need to other people. So by being real and being authentic and bringing your, like a brand personality out um, and prioritizing authenticity, you humanize your brand and that allows you to foster relationships, be social on social and um, you know, increase your engagement on and off line. So that's the whole promise of, I know all of you have probably heard about the app, Be Real. So showing exactly what you're doing in an exact moment, no curation, that's the goal. We all know that people are probably curating anyway in the background because two minutes is a long time. But that was why it was created and why it's so popular because people crave authenticity and they demand this type of content. So brands have personalities, be authentic with them. So some examples here, this is a day of the life of an intern at IPG Health. So we, instead of posting, you know, interviewing an intern, putting her in front of a camera, what's so great about this internship, we said, you take photos of your day, you send it to us, we'll stitch it together and we'll share it. And that's what he did. It took like no time whatsoever, no fancy video equipment or anything like that, but it outperformed all of our content. It got 3,598 views, which was about like five times our average. Um, and so because it was one relevant, which we had talked about before, but it was authentic. It wasn't overly polished. Just say, this is what the company wants to talk about their brand or their experience. This is the intern themselves saying their own story. And here's another example. Many of our, I talked about like IPG Health having multiple agencies, um, but many people, you know, posted their Halloween content um, and we compiled it and put it together. So like, this is a true behind the scenes, um, you know, photo of what it's like to be a part of our, you know, company. It's not all buttoned up. We have, you know, this is our true self. We're being authentic here. And this performs so much better than if we had gotten people, someone to design a happy Halloween post or something like that. So the takeaway there is to be human. Don't post overly curated content that only, you know, a, a company would do because you're not trying to be like a company, you're trying to be like a human. Um, post as if you were a person and show your true self. This applies to whether you're a company or a person you know, posting like about themselves, you know, being real is so important. Um, and time and time again, I've seen content that centers authenticity performs so much better because it embodies the true nature of being social on social. So the next point here is that people want to engage with people, not brands. People want to form relationships with people, not brands. So by putting the focus on people, your social content, um, you encourage engagement and relationship building from your audience. And I had referred to this earlier, but 
Um, it's one of our like psychological needs to feel belonging. So false people go to social to feel connections. Social media was designed, think back in the day 2004 Facebook, when it was literally designed to connect college students. It was not designed for, you know, companies to use as marketing materials so or a marketing platform. So being focusing on people and fostering relationships are like, such a big key to tapping into people's needs and wants, forever needs and wants that apply across all different platforms to be successful. So here's an example from IPG Health where we focused on uh, the post on our CEO. Our CEO, Dana, uh, Dana is very personable. She's formed connections with so many people in the company and she's seen as a leading voice in healthcare marketing. And for lack of a better word, she's an influencer. Um, instead of posting a basic post for Women's History Month, we got a powerful quote from her and shared it. The result, because we made her the face of the post, was that it reached 35,000 people, which is about five, time our, five times our average on LinkedIn. And then here's another example as well. We sent her, you know, there's a lot of marketing awards out there, Can Lions, London International Awards. We sent her our people for our award ceremonies. So rather than just um, publishing like press releases or awards that they've won, um, we give the camera to our leaders and the people behind the scenes. So in this center photo, you see uh, Eliza, our amazing creative awards manager, and she is posting an inside look into the London International Awards. She went around and she interviewed the jurors about the trends that they're seeing, and it got a lot of engagement because people looked up to these people, and so they wanted to in engage with the people, not necessarily IPG Health. And then on either end of that, you see people, um, some of our leaders at award shows, and they're being themselves, like, and people engage because they feel connections with those people and they're fostering connections with those people. So the next time someone sees, you know, one of those featured on, um, you know, the left, let's say, um, her name is Jen Ma. If someone sees Jen Ma and, you know, they see a content, content from her focusing on her later down the line, they've already formed a connection with her here. And then, you know, these this content is also shared on like our newsletter and website as well to form connections like, or put or humanize our brand across, you know, many of our different touch points as well. Here is an NYU post. Um, this is a student who was accepted into NYU Steinhardt, the School of Education. And you see their true authentic reaction and it is so powerful and so touching. So what we did, I'm just gonna go ahead, is that we commented on this photo, this video, that he had initially posted. We said, congrats, welcome to our community. And you can see that I got 75 likes there. That, seven, that wasn't you know, the person who posted liking 75 times. That was a bunch of people who saw that we commented and was like, oh, this brand is actually like congratulating this person. Like this is some like a brand that's personable, but also like, hey, congrats, you're being recognized by this you know, institution. So by actively commenting, um, you know, you increase a sense of brand loyalty and pride because someone feels seen and they feel heard. They feel seen from the institution that just accepted them. And a stat around that is that 62% of people actually say they feel better about themselves when people react positively to what they post on social media. So engagements make us feel good. So, you know, that's the psychology around it. We want to feel seen and we want to feel heard. So instead of just like liking a post, we commented, and then we also said, we love your video. Can we share it on our social channels as well? So we use this to create, you know, user-generated content. It took us no effort. We copied the, of course, with the student's permission, we copied the caption, we shared the video, and it got a ton of engagement. And people were like, oh, I'm so, so nice to meet you. Like, I can't wait to you know, go to school with you, like, well, what class are you doing? Um, so we connected, uh, created a connection, not just with, you know, the audience member, but also with encouraged connections between this new student with other new students or current students as well. So you're forming an even greater sense of community. So jump ahead a little bit. This is similar. We can see that this is another person who got into NYU and the simple act of being social, like, yes, congrats, welcome to the community. Um, you know, encouraged, you know, action. And this person who 
also we commented on their posts. Now they feel a sense of like loyalty to us. We've seen them. And so they'll follow us. They actually engage with us more and our content shows up on their feeds more because we are seen as now relevant, getting back to that um, previous comment as well. Um, and other people commented using, you know, that social to form that community. So you can see in the last comment, congrats, my daughter just got off the wait list. Hey, you can connect with someone, you can connect with the daughter, like we're all going to be in the same school together. So like from the beginning of time, we thrived to be in packs and part of communities. And that's the same here. This is no different. We're just using social media to do it. And then one more focusing on active engagement, which I've already mentioned, but comments uh, go so much more, go such a long way as compared to simply liking something because you're actually taking the time out to comment and congratulate someone. And then you can see not just being, you know, engaging with people who are posting about you, but reaching out for to engage with people as well. Someone posted here, literally my dream school. Hey, let us know if you need any help to start applying. And they reached out to us. I don't think they would have anyway, but like we were personable. So they felt like they could come to us. And then over here, this isn't necessarily a person, uh, but I didn't necessarily want to create a new section with this. Um, but as you know, we're parts of communities, we want to shape our perception in said communities. It goes back to the clothes that we wear, the music that we listen to, because we all want to be seen a certain way. So online, we have the time to construct and redefine um, our image. And that's what like scientists actually call self-presentation. And so what we do on social is that we share things that shape our self-perception. Humans actually devote 30 to 40% of the speech talking about themselves in person, but that jumps astronomically to 80% when we're on social. Um, so we wanna feel seen, heard, and celebrated in our community. This was when NYU Steinhardt, the School of Education, was named the sixth best school of graduate school of education in the country. So authentic photo, didn't just pop a, a six in a graphic design, went and got a, a balloon and put it in front of the NYU Steinhardt sign. And because it like looked real, it got more engagement, but also people shared this on their Instagram stories, their LinkedIn profiles, their Twitter feeds, because they were also saying, hey, not only did the school get number six, I got number six, you know, they identify it with it. And, you know, I'm guilty of this too. I don't necessarily post about my alma maters, but the second they like, you know, reach, get a certain ranking, I'm like, I, for NYU, because I was an alum there too, like I bleed violet, that's their saying, but I don't usually post about them, but it's more me saying like, hey, look at me. I'm, this is also me. I attended a top school. So keep that in mind when you're shaping content as well, that like whatever you, to encourage shares, people share based on creating a self um, presentation on, or a self, their own self identity on social. So some points here, build and serve your community. I mean, we saw it like community is so important, whether we're in person, you know, or during COVID, we literally flocked to online spaces to build community. So by building and serving a community, you can have people rally around your brand. Um, some of the like best companies and people have mastered it. They found niches. They give their people a voice. They engage with their people. They make them feel seen and heard. And in turn, they engage with the brand. They want to people want to be a part of something bigger and they want to, and the need to feel seen is innate. Um, and then a stat here is that 80% of people, and this comes from a, a New York Times study um, on online sharing, and they found that 80% of people share and engage because they on social because they want to grow and nourish relationships. So when you're posting content on social or engaging on social, keeping that top of mind is important. Like, does this grow and nourish? a relationship. And the second is to prioritize engagement. So I said it before, I'll say it again, like social media by social, it, by definition is social. It isn't a bullhorn. So to be social, you need to foster relationships and be like a friend. You know, you, you know, wouldn't want a friend who just keeps talking to you and then, or you wouldn't want a friend that you just keep talking to and they don't talk to you back. Right. So you want that like 50, 50 relationship. And that's what builds loyal customers with your company, organization, brand. Engage with them, comment on their posts, 
Don't just like them, congratulate them. People want to feel seen, showcase them, be a friend to them. The algorithms also prefer it. They prefer engagement because then it shows again to the platforms that this is a company or this is a brand that's relevant to said you know audience member and they show up more. Um, but they'll engage with you more on and off social and we'll talk more about you as well. So it generates positive word of mouth um, and your people that you necessarily have, haven't necessarily paid to be influencers for your brand are now authentic like influencers for your brand. And then we have sparking emotion, more psychological and social, but content that um, sparks emotion makes us want to share. So there is something called the science of virality. Jonah Berger, he's the author of a book, Contagious. He says that virality is partially driven by psychological arousal. He did the study with the New York Times. Content that evokes high, ar ar high arousal um, that's positive, such as awe, or negative anger, anxiety, emotions is what makes content go viral. Content that evokes low emotion, um, such as sadness, is less viral. So we see that on social, right? The things that we see constantly are the things that are the most ridiculous, the most funny. Those are the things that like start to be shared so much more because they're we just have to show it to somebody else because we can't just keep it to ourselves. So here's an example of a post that contained emotion. So. Here you can see we focused on people. Purple was front and center. Purple is NYU's um, uh, color, and that's what was relevant to our audience. So it made them stop scrolling. But here's a story, again, user-generated content. We just posted the caption and asked permission to use the photo. Um, a student who, um, her grandparents dropped out of high school, didn't go to school when they were 12 and 14. She herself, um, you know, was kicked out of community college for a GPA of 1.071. And here she is getting her second master's. And it's a whole paragraph. But the thing is, it got so much engagement, like 1,115 likes, but there's so many shares, comments, and all in addition to that. So you see these like 31 comments over here where people are saying like, I can't wait to meet you. Congratulations. You know, welcome to the community. Um, and then because it sparked such you know, intense emotion that here's someone who really did something who people were in awe. That's what it got people to engage and to share. And then on top of that, because it was seen by so many people, because the algorithms were like, oh, this post is of interest to people. Let me show it to other like-minded people. Um, someone else who was interested in NYU said, wow, wow, congratulations. This person in the um, picture got a first generation scholarship. This, um, you know, commenter says, what's a first generation scholarship? We're like, hey, look over there. Here's where you can find out more info. So because it's using using the social principles to amp up content, um, instead of just you know putting out a post that says, hey, we have a first generation scholarship, check it out. This was so much more powerful. So algorithms always change, platforms always change. We're literally, like I said, seeing that with Twitter right now. We're seeing it with Be Real right now. Who knows the future of both? But how and why we act, our needs and our wants uh, to be social don't change. Our needs to be a part of a community don't change. So when um, you're doing communications for a company or you're managing social channels, take a step back from all the likes, all the comments before anything. Think of user behavior. Think about how to be social and you'll be successful. So that's it. Opening it up for questions. Thank you so much. I'll start until we get some questions. You can either, uh, participants, you can either answer or ask a question in the Q&A box uh, or in the chat box. I'll monitor both of those. Uh, but so you mentioned be real. So I, I've i been teaching communication and PR for a long time. And usually I learn about things from my students. And I was so disappointed in my students in a funny way last year because I discovered Be Real on my own. And I'm like, why didn't you all tell me about this? But none of that, I mean, I'm teaching grad students now, which is much different than undergrad. So I learned I learned more from the undergrads. Uh, so, but none of my grad students were using Be Real. So I downloaded the app because of course I, ha I had to, I, you know, I have to do my, you know, my research. Uh, right. And so my question is how, and is Be Real 
used with companies or organizations? Because I haven't seen that yet, but again, I don't use the app frequently. <laughs> no, it hasn't been used much at all. And I think, you know, uh, if someone's on it, let's say, you know, if JHU is on it, that's an opportunity to be like, okay, two minutes, let me run down to, um, you know, the gym and show like what's happening right now in this particular spot. Yeah. Like, you know, you would give it to somebody who's on the move constantly because mm -hmm. like if you're, you know, you sitting on your desk, like I'm always mm -hmm. sitting on my desk, I wouldn't be the proper candidate for that. Right, right. Um, but to show like what the, you know, campus life is like on a, a daily basis, mm -hmm. you can like, have someone who obviously trustworthy be like, hey, this is it. Right. This is it. Um, if you have a face of a brand that's different, you can show that as well. Um, so there's two different ways of, of doing that. Yeah, I guess you just gave me an idea, and I don't know how this would work, of course, because of account access and things, but I, I think, you know how Instagram, you do Facebook takeover, or Instagram takeovers, stories with students, I guess that would be the one thing I could see with Be Real and universities of having, you know, students, but again, that access and privacy and all those things are other issues. Yeah, we used to do takeovers all the time. I mean, I don't, they still are, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's like finding someone who's trustworthy and yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that goes with any company and any like brand as well. Like you have to know right. that this person is going to be good. They're recommended when yep. back in the day, like we had, um, people, when I was working at NYU, we had people sign like forms that they were not going to say anything bad. They were not going right. to do anything bad. Exactly. Um, so you got to do all that due diligence. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any yeah, exactly. Do we have any questions? I guess another thing while we wait for questions come in is uh, in term of, oh, we have a question. Uh, if we're posting videos on, so, okay. If we're posting videos on social, is there a duration limit? 30 seconds, one minute, three minutes, et cetera. Yeah. So there is no um, particular limit. Each platform is different, but um, again, think about like re relevancy and also like our attention span. I didn't bring up the whole, like, you know, our attention span is less than a goldfish because that research is like, right. Yeah. But you know, if something is not capturing our attention like that, mm -hmm. like we're going to scroll past, it doesn't matter if it's three minutes. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, 15 seconds, you know, mm -hmm. it's, we have to scroll past. So think of that first, um, you know, on let's say Instagram or TikTok, they say that like seven seconds, mm -hmm. seven, 15 yeah. seconds is the best. Mm -hmm. Um, for YouTube, people use it to learn as well. It's the second largest search engine. Yep. So something can be an hour long. Mm -hmm. If it's you know something that's relevant to someone, um, people will like do the dishes and play it in the background. So that's why I'm like, um, I wanted to focus on relevancy more than you know the technicalities behind mm -hmm. the platforms mm -hmm. because that's more important. Someone will listen for an hour if it's relevant to mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I liked what you had mentioned about the program too, in terms of the focus on research. And I, I think that's so important. I tell my students that this, this is what is going to make you stick out from other people in, in the job market is that you're going to understand the research behind why you're doing things mm -hmm. and you're going to be able to explain and pitch something, but evidence-based research shows X, Y, and Z, not just, this seems like a great idea. <laughs> hundred percent. Like I have told people, like, people are like, how do you do this? How are it, how are you able to like know all of this? And like, you know, I don't do my own homework, like be able to be so successful, successful, right. honestly, like check out this program because mm -hmm. it was so useful for me to like focus on the research, focus mm -hmm. on like the data tells me focus on, I'm like people, you know, Johns Hopkins didn't tell me like, you know, blogging was the thing and taught me how to blog because when I was in school and I graduated in 2016, blogging was the thing, but right. Like focus on what people actually want. What do people, you know, mm -hmm. actually, you know, want to see how do they act? And that's exactly. continuous. Yeah. And like you said, like it's, you're, you weren't focusing on what platform to use today because that's, it's going to be ever changing. And so it's again, thinking about behavior change, what makes people tick, what makes people pay attention, what makes people act behavior change. So yeah, that's great. Let's see, do we have any other questions here? So I, I guess I'm going to go back to be real. Like, do you think that's going to stick around or? You know what? I don't think so, to be honest. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> the 
reason is um because TikTok has adopted it and they had call it TikTok now, I think, or something yeah. like that. And then yeah. Instagram is adopting it as well. And we saw right. that happen with Snapchat. So they're gonna like exactly yeah. Gone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, wait. So do you have any advice for understanding what's relevant to your target audience, especially when you're not a part of that target audience? Find someone and talk to them. Um, because you know, the best way to learn about someone is through conversation. You, you know, the, we all have connections somewhere, you know, from a friend of a friend, just be like, Hey, can, would you mind? Like, if I talk to you, pick your brain about something. Um, that's one thing. Examine, um, their behavior on online. Um, social listening is huge. You can see what people are talking about. You can see if there's people, you know, interested in technology and they're not talking about this one particular thing. It can be assumed that's not of interest to them, but if they're really talking about, you know, something else, if they're talking about text to image, let's say like, Mm -hmm. Hey, that's something that's, you know, uh, that's something that they care about. So, Mm -hmm. you know, social listening was huge. Um, I've done that. I did that a lot at my last job at NYU. Like, what do people care about? I actually had, I am, I was not a student, but I had formed a focus group of students that Mm -hmm. I would consult throughout the year and be like, Hey, with this, is this, do people, do you care about this? And people would often say no. And I'd be like, oh, to the drawing. (laughs) Right. Um, But but yeah, I mean, it saves, it takes time, but it saves. Yeah. Yeah. You can also yeah. like, you know, look into research, look into studies, all of that too. But our people are like communities are so niche now that, you know, mm-hmm. it's difficult to, to do that. So like, once you get into a company, get into a job, like do your social listening, see if you can, you know, find someone who's part of that audience group and talk to them and just like, Hey, what gets you to, what gets right. you to, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's good advice. We have any other questions? We've got another 30 seconds or so. <laughs> yeah, I guess do you have any advice for anyone that might be on on here that is looking for a position, you know, similar to yours? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say really bring forth your knowledge of psychology one and how user behavior, but also like data. I didn't mm-hmm. dig into data here, but that's one of the things that's given me competitive edge is that I'm able to say like, here's what the data tells us. This is what we should mm-hmm. be doing. Not mm-hmm. necessarily like, oh, this is, you know, such a great idea. I'm an expert on TikTok. Let me do this. Like, yeah. On, you know, and give examples of how you were able to do that. You know, even examples from, you know, from your time here in the program. I remember I was, um, I think it was 2016. I had done um, a whole communications plan for a nonprofit. Um, that was one of the classes, and you had to do that. Mm-hmm. And I had used that to get my next job because nice. they wanted to see my work. So I was like, yeah, "Here, yeah, that's awesome." Fine, you know, thing. But it included there all of this like mm-hmm. data backed information from like how you know the audience would act. A lot of that came from social listening, as per like mm-hmm. the previous like question. Mm-hmm. So you know, use that. Um, focus on data, focus on research, and you can use what you've learned in this program here to get your job. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so very much for your time and your expertise and all the great examples. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure everyone else on on here does and whoever else listens for that's not on here. So thank you again for your time and everyone for joining. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your evening. You too. Bye.